Good evening, Nottingham. The Nottingham in the room, and if I understand correctly, a few people in Nottingham on Zoom. Shall I just say hello to them? Hi. Okay. It's nice to talk to real people, having spent 18 months or so giving talks via Zoom. I think I gave about 75 talks in total during the pandemic, so it's nice to actually see people once again. So this is Fiat Lux 3, a rather odd title, you might think. And the reason it's called Fiat Lux 3 is because it originally was the third in a trilogy of talks. Perhaps that's not it, it altogether surprising. It was originally a trilogy of Fiat Lux, which was a whole load of demonstrations in which I would, with a few demos on the front table, measure the speed of light, measure the wavelength of light, measure the polarization of light, and measure the, uh, what have I just said, the, the, the speed, the wavelength, the polarization, and the colors of light. That was followed by another talk saying, if that is the nature of light, how does that influence our design of telescopes? In other words, how does that affect the way mirrors and lenses are used in telescopes, and hence telescope design? And having said, this is the nature of light, this is how it influences the design of telescopes, Fiat Lux 3 was, let's have a look at a telescope, a, if you like, a sort of design study of let's have a look at a telescope that will be coming online in the not too distant future. So that's why this talk is called Fiat Lux 3. The particular telescope I chose to illustrate how telescopes work is the so-called Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, the LSST. Its name has in fact changed, but I'm going to continue to call it that for the remainder of the talk, and I'll tell you at the end about the naming convention. So although that's why this is called Fiat Lux 3, for you guys from Nottingham, perhaps it's better to reorder that trilogy and to say it's the third part of a trilogy where the first talk I gave two years ago about the Hale telescope, that was a telescope of the past. Last time I was with you virtually by Zoom, and I told you about the Hubble telescope, which is the telescope of the present. And so this is the telescope of the future, or at least one of the many telescopes of the future. So we can think of Fiat Lux 3 as being the third in this telescope trilogy for Nottingham AS. So there it is, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. A bit of a mouthful, but the LSST acronym has been around for about a decade or so, even if people don't use the full title. But the full title is actually quite useful because it tells you what it is. This is, again, things like uh, changing the name of the W1st telescope from W1st, which meant Wide Field Infrared Telescope. It told you exactly what it did. And renaming it, well, that's great in terms of honoring a particular individual, but it's nice to think of the original acronym because it tells you what it is. It's a large telescope. It's designed to do surveys of the sky. And it's synoptic, meaning it's the big picture. It is not homing in on particular detail. It's trying to survey, essentially, the entire sky. So this talk is going to be looking at sky surveys in general, a little bit of history about what sky surveys have already taken place. Why do we need yet another sky survey? Don't we know already what's up there? Why do we need another survey, and why do we need a, tele a new telescope to do that survey? Why don't we just survey the sky with whatever telescopes happen to be around? What science is the LSST going to deliver for us? What will it deliver in terms of knowledge or understanding about the solar system or the Milky Way or the universe more generally? And how will that be delivered? In other words, the technology that needs to be in place in order for the LSST to do its job. And finally, a few words about the operation in terms of how it's going to do the survey and the enormous problem of what to do with all the data. So we can ask ourselves the question. Being astronomers, we tend to ask this question all the time. What's out there? It's a pretty fundamental question. And when we look into the night sky, either with our naked eye or with telescopes, we see a whole shed load of stuff out there, loads of stars, loads of galaxies. And the bigger telescopes we have, the more we see. But in terms of what's out there, if you think, well, don't all telescopes answer that question by looking at what's in the universe? Well, no, not really. 
most research telescopes don't tell us what's out there. They look at things that we already know about. They look at known objects, objects that have already been surveyed and observed and classified and catalogued. Only then do we know what the interesting objects are that we then send Hubble or other big telescopes to go look at. So we need sky surveys. And everything in the sky, I say everything, but of course there are limitations. For any given telescope, you can only survey what's in the sky from your location on Earth, and you can only see a given distance or a given look-back time. Depends on how faint your particular telescope is sensitive to. So, surveying everything in the sky that can be seen from a given location, subject to a certain limiting magnitude of brightness, these surveys have been carried out, quite a few of them, in the last century. If we go back to the Palomar Observatory back in the 1940s and 50s, then the 48-inch Smith, which was built alongside the 200-inch Hale telescope that I told you about two, uh, two talks ago, two years ago, the 48-inch Smith was designed to take pictures of the entire sky as visible from North America, and some 2,000 photographic plates were taken, and that effectively gave the targets that the 200-inch or 5-meter Hale telescope would then follow up. The Palomar Observatory Sky Survey was repeated again in the 1980s and 90s, this time with more sensitive photographic plates, so they could see the same sky, but deeper. They could see fainter objects. Then we changed from using plates to, uh, to CCDs, and the Sloan Digital Sky Survey in the noughties going into the teenies, a couple of two-meter class telescopes were used and took something of order a million images to survey the sky. That was followed, or actually it overlaps with PANSTARS, and PANSTARS is an acronym for Panoramic Survey Telescope and Rapid Response System. The idea of PANSTARS was look at the entire sky and keep looking as often as you can to see things change, to see things change their brightness or to see new objects appear or to see objects move. And so, of course, some comets have been named PANSTARS because that was particularly good at finding new comets. So these surveys have been around for quite a while, but there's always a need for new ones. And the latest survey is going to be carried out by the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, or the LSST. Dates there are nominal. 2022, of course, is only a few months away now. Uh, but that was the intended start date um, as of a couple of years ago. And uh, the dreaded C word has intervened, so COVID has put this back a little way. So maybe it won't be starting its operation in 2022. Maybe it'll just be a little bit behind that, but still not too far away. And this is the telescope I'm talking about. It looks a bit odd compared to some of the larger telescopes that you may be used to. And that is simply because it is a survey telescope. It hasn't got a huge focal length compared to its diameter of mirror. In other words, it's a very small F number, which I'll come back to shortly. So it looks rather stocky. And that also means that it's able to move quite quickly, and hence that's one of the features that we need for a survey telescope. We don't want to spend 10 minutes moving from one part of the sky to another. So its design has been taken into account for how it does the surveys and how quickly it moves from one target to the next. So why another sky survey? If we think about the number of objects, and objects in this case means stars or galaxies or other stuff, which could be asteroids or, in principle, planets. If we think about the number of objects that have been surveyed as a function of time, if we go back to the early Palomar survey, we found that it only achieves this sort of number, 100 million. It might sound like a lot, but 100 million isn't that many stars. It isn't that many galaxies. This gray line at the top is the sort of ceiling, if you like. It's the holy grail of what we would like to survey. That line is drawn at the 100 billion mark. There are, of order, 100 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. There are, of order, 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. So if we could get anywhere close to that gray line, then we're getting close to surveying everything that's out there. Perhaps we'll never get to that point, but if we compare, for instance, the Palomar survey down here at 100 million, 
100 million sounds impressive until you realize it's many, many orders of magnitude below what we know actually exists. And if we go to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, we find that's an improvement coming into the noughties now, but still we're sitting there between a few hundred million and a billion objects. And if we go to PanStars, another improvement in the 2010-2014 sort of uh, date range, but still we're tr struggling to get to that grey line. The intention of the LSST is to get there. Now, the LSST, that particular bar is shown between 2022 and 2032, not necessarily accurate, but work has been in progress for quite a few years now. It started a few years ago. Where are we at the moment? We're somewhere there at the red arrow. And so we're perhaps a couple of years away from the LSST being operational. But you can see the aim. The aim is to actually survey not just a few billion but many tens of billions of objects, which is a very significant fraction of everything we think we're capable of seeing in terms of stars in the Milky Way, in terms of galaxies in the observable universe. So it's a logical step, and it is getting us much closer to having not just a tiny sample of what's out there, but a significant sample of what is actually out there. The mantra of LSST is wide, fast, and deep. Because we can say, OK, we want to do a survey. We want to see what's out there. Why don't we just pick a telescope we've already got and use that? Well, there are certain characteristics we need of a survey telescope. It must have three basic characteristics, the wide, fast, deep mantra of the LSST. It must have a wide field of view. If we've got a really good telescope, but it only has a narrow field of view, it is going to take us ages to map the entire sky. For instance, if you take the Hubble Space Telescope, fantastic instrument that I told you about last year, one hell of a legacy. But if you wanted the Hubble Space Telescope to map everything in the sky, rather than just pick a few objects that it finds interesting, then it would take the Hubble perhaps centuries to map the sky. And if you wanted to map the sky more than once to see if things are changing or not, it might take you a millennium. So the Hubble Space Telescope is not the right telescope to use to survey the sky. You need something with a much wider field of view. You also need fast optics. I'll come back to what I mean by fast in just a second. It's probably familiar to those of you who are familiar with the idea of photographic lenses being fast or slow. But basically, we need a set of telescope optics which is fast enough to keep the exposure sh short. Again, what we want to do is not only map the entire sky, we want to map the entire sky quickly. We don't want to take a year doing it. We want to be able to take it on a relatively short time scale so that we can map it and then map it again and then again and then again and watch things change rather than just have a static, we've done the survey, we've scanned the sky once, that's it, set in stone. No, the universe is dynamic. So we want to be able to take exposures that are relatively short. None of this one million seconds of the Hubble deep field, we don't want that, we want nice short exposures. So we need fast optics. And we want to go deep. We want to see a lot of what's out there, and of course some of these stars are a long way in terms of some of the stars might be local to our part of the Milky Way galaxy, but some of them will be on the other side of the galaxy. They will be very faint compared to the stars that are quite close to us. Similarly, the galaxies that are quite close to us are quite easy to see, but some of the galaxies we would like to be able to image are many billions of light years away. Even those faint ones we want to be able to catch with our survey. If we want to catch tens of billions of galaxies, we need to catch a large fraction of them, we need to be able to catch the faint ones. So it needs to be a wide angle, it needs to be fast optics to keep the exposure short, but we also want to be able to pick, uh, pick out the faint objects. And faint, for those of you who know about magnitudes, we want to get to something of order magnitude 25 in a relatively short exposure not in an exposure that takes days or weeks. So we can do a little bit of horse trading between wide, fast, and deep in terms of um, optimizing. But if we want the best survey telescope money can buy, 
then we need it to excel in all of those areas. It must be really wide angle, it must be really fast, and it must be able to go really deep. So let's just clarify what we mean by fast. Fast is a term that's used in optics, especially in photography, which means a large diameter for a given focal length. In other words, the F number, which is the focal length of any optical system divided by the diameter, that gives us an idea of how much light is actually arriving at the sensor. And what we want is a large diameter for a given focal length. In other words, we want this particular number to be quite small. The smaller the better in terms of catching faint objects. If we end up with an optical system with a large F number, then it's going to be very difficult to catch faint objects without giving very long exposures. And that gets, that's against this philosophy of mapping the sky relatively quickly. So the reason it's called fast is simply because with a brighter image, when you're thinking about photography, you can have a faster shutter speed or a shorter exposure, if you like, if you want to think of it in more astronomical terms. A shorter exposure means a faster shutter speed, and so small f numbers are referred to as fast optics. All it means is a large diameter given the focal length. And we can see what that means if we just take a hypothetical situation. If we wanted to expose for one minute at an f number of two, this scale here, ranging from faster to slower, these all let the same amount of light onto the sensor. A one minute exposure with an optical system that's f2, the focal length being twice the diameter, that lets the same amount of light onto the sensor as a two-minute exposure at f2.8 or a four-minute exposure at f4, etc., etc., etc. And so anybody that's dabbled with astrophotography knows that the ideal situation is to have a camera lens with a relatively small f number, perhaps f2, 2.84. All of these will give a nice amount of light falling onto your sensor if you have a camera lens with a low f number. But if we think about the F number of telescopes we're familiar with, like the Hubble Space Telescope, for instance, its mirror diameter is a whopping 2.4 meters. But bear in mind, its focal length can be anything up to 57 meters, depending on which instrument you've, you're actually using and the effective focal length of the camera. You can see that the focal length divided by the diameter is a whopping 22. It's F22. It's like taking your beautiful lens and stopping it all the way down again, for those that are familiar with photographic lenses. So the Hubble Space Telescope is by no means a fast optical arrangement. And you might say, oh, yeah, but surely the European Extremely Large Telescope will be coming online soon. That's got a whopping 40-meter diameter mirror. I mean, how huge do you want it? Surely that's going to be a very fast system. That's going to collect a huge amount of light. Well, yes, it is going to collect a huge amount of light, but the focal length can be anything up to 750 meters. And so the F number of the EELT is going to be about F16 or so. The Hubble Space Telescope and huge aperture telescopes on Earth that are currently being designed are not fast in the optical sense of fast. They can take wonderful pictures of detail of lots of objects, but they can't do it particularly quickly. We want to get something that's at this end of the F number spectrum, not at the Hubble end of the F number spectrum. What are the key aspects of the LSST's performance? Having designed something, we'll look at the optics in a little while, having designed something that is fast and in principle deep and a wide angle, the intention is to map the sky every three nights. In other words, on any given night, most of which are clear, then it should be able to map one third of the sky that it can see. And on the next two nights, it will then do the next third and next third. After three nights, it will have mapped the entire sky. And then it goes back and does it again, and again, and again. Of course, as the year progresses, it'll see a slightly different chunk of sky visible during its night time. But the idea is that it will do this over and over again. And so during the 10 years of the project, it is going to not simply map and record the brightness of this star, the brightness of that galaxy, the position of this object in the solar system. 
it will do that repeatedly many, many, many times. In some cases, a hundred times. In some cases, perhaps, it will end up imaging a particular object a thousand times during its 10-year lifetime. And they will be recorded, the positions and the colors and the brightnesses of these objects will be recorded all of these hundreds of times over the 10-year lifetime. So it's the fact what makes the LSST really an important survey instrument is not only the number of objects it will catalog, the fact that it will catalog tens of billions of objects. It's not simply that very large number. It's the fact that it will do it over and over and over again many times during 10 years. So it's not just going to take a snapshot of the universe. It is looking for changes over periods of hours and days and weeks and months as it goes through its 10-year lifetime. What are we going to do with the science? What are we going to do with this data? What science do we hope is going to come out of simply staring at the sky and taking lots of surveys? Well, it should be able to detect a lot of objects in our solar system. We know where the planets are. We know where quite a few of the asteroids are. but the LSST will be able to map a huge number of objects within the solar system that we don't yet know exist. It will be looking at a very large fraction of the number of stars in the Milky Way, not just the ones in our locality, not just the ones a few thousand light years away from the sun. It will be mapping stars across the entire Milky Way as best it can. There will always be some stars that are difficult to see because they're behind the central bulge of the core of the Milky Way. But that notwithstanding, the LSST will catalog positions of stars across the Milky Way. And it will be looking at tens of billions of galaxies, making a note of their position in the sky, their shape, their color, etc. It can only do that by developing new telescope optics. The only way you can get a wide angle and catch all this information to go this deep to magnitude 25 across a wide field of skies, wide enough that you can capture one third of the sky on a given night, the only way you can do that is with novel optics and novel detectors. And the amount of data that's going to come out of the LSST is going to be absolutely astounding and will keep PhD students going, I'm sure, for many, many decades to come. It will be the largest catalogue of astronomical objects by far. As soon as it starts operating, it will collect more data than every other telescope has collected up to this point. And we hope that that will then underpin a lot of the scientific developments in the next decade or next few decades. So what are the principal elements of the science of the LSST project? I'm not going to have time to dwell on all of the details, but let's just have a look at what it will be able to do. In terms of the solar system, it will effectively take an inventory of what's out there. As I say, we know that there are planets and asteroids and a few bits and pieces that we've looked at in detail. Some objects, of course, have been visited by space probes. But the idea is to take an inventory of the entire solar system. And the LSST will be capable of recording the positions of something like a million objects that are out there. In terms of what's going on within the Milky Way, if we can look at the stars, again, not just the stars that are local to us, but the stars across the entire Milky Way, we hopefully will get a much better idea of how the Milky Way is put together. The Gaia spacecraft is doing some very high resolution astrometry, trying to work out where certain stars are. The LSST will complement that by looking at a very large number of stars. It won't be positionally quite as accurate as Gaia, but the LSST will be able to look at a lot of stars and determine their position, their motion, and their color, and their brightness, and any changes of brightness, and any changes of color, and any changes of position of those many, many stars within the Milky Way. And it will be able to look in more detail at those stars that do happen to be close to the sun in terms of our position within the Milky Way galaxy. On a much larger scale, the LSST has the job, if you like, of trying to solve one of the big questions about what's going on in the universe. 
by cataloguing some 20 billion galaxies. That's the calculated number that we think we'll be able to catch. If we can go to magnitude 25, or perhaps 26, or perhaps 27, it's estimated that the LSST will be able to catalogue some 20 billion galaxies. Individual galaxies, colliding galaxies, interacting galaxies, galaxy clusters, galaxy superclusters. All of these will be recorded and, in principle, the data analysed to tell us about these large-scale structures in the universe. And that will help us get a handle on what the hell this is, dark matter. We know dark matter is out there. We can see certain effects. Telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope can stare at a galaxy cluster and can observe the light being bent from more distant objects as the light passes the gravitational mass of the cluster. And from that, we deduce there's more mass there than can be accounted for by simply counting up all the stars in all the galaxies of the cluster that is bending the light. So we know the dark matter is out there, but we don't know exactly where. If we take this example or that example or this example, we can home in on a few examples and stare at those with big telescopes and see what's going on. But what we want is the big picture. Where is the dark matter in the universe in general? Not so much where is it in this galaxy cluster or where is it in that one, where is it spread? How is it distributed? And if you can work out how the dark matter is distributed, and the LSST will be looking at nearby galaxies and more distant galaxies, and of course the more distant galaxies are effectively being viewed further back in time, by looking at how the dark matter is distributed as a function of the age of the universe, that will give us a handle on the other great mystery, what is dark energy. So we think that dark energy exists and it appears to be accelerating the expansion of the universe and it seems to be destined to rip the universe apart in some billions of years down the road. And by looking at dark matter as a function of time, we can get a handle on dark energy. We can also look at supernova as well as distant galaxies. The LSST is thought to be able to detect a very, very large number of supernova. And I'll come back to that in just a second. So that's a taste of some of the science that the LSST, hopefully, is going to contribute to. In a single exposure, a single exposure from the detector is thought to probably catch 5,000 moving objects. In other words, probably about 5,000 objects in the solar system. So these dots, of course, are shown rather larger than they will actually appear in the final image, just to give you an idea of just what we're talking about. If a single exposure of the telescope can produce 5,000 moving objects, then by the time it surveyed the sky, it is thought that the LSST will identify something of order a million, or probably many millions, of asteroids, trans-Neptunian objects, and hundreds of thousands of near-Earth objects as well. Now, some of these we already know about. The largest ones, perhaps the top 10%, we might already know about. But that still leaves us with a fraction of a million of the smaller objects which LSST will be able to pick up. And for those that are near-Earth objects that are in danger of hitting the Earth, that's quite an important role in itself. We know that there are huge numbers of near-Earth objects out there, some of them potentially hazardous because they have orbits that cross the orbit of the Earth. And if we think about how our solar system is put together, we know that we have the terrestrial planets in the middle and then we have the, uh, the gas giants and the ice giants further out. And if we zoom out once more, beyond Neptune, we know that there are a few objects floating around out there and possibly Planet Nine as well. LSST will probably, within maybe a few months, certainly during its lifetime, will put that to rest. It will map the sky. If Planet Nine is there, it will find it quite quickly. Planet Nine is thought to be of a magnitude such that it's within the grasp of LSST. So not only will it find a few trans-Neptune objects, it will probably find thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of trans-Neptunian objects. And if Planet Nine is out there, the LSST will find it. 
when it comes to thinking about our Milky Way, that's not as easy as it sounds because trying to figure out what the Milky Way looks like, remember we're trying to map it, but we are inside it. If only we had a bird's eye view, we could see what the structure of the Milky Way was. And it's easy to say, well, yeah, I can see there, there's four spiral arms, there's the sun there at that particular position. But of course, trying to work that out from our location is not trivial, which is why we've got spacecraft like Gaia and why the LSST, by mapping out where the stars are in the Milky Way, with the exception of it's going to be difficult to look at stars on the other side of the core of the Milky Way, apart from that, it should be able to map out where these stars are and hence work out exactly what the structure of the Milky Way is. It's been calculated that a single exposure of a particular area of the sky will map out a volume some 10 times larger than the volume that has been mapped out by all previous surveys. In other words, forget the Palomar surveys, just think about the Sloan and the Panstars surveys. They have mapped out a number of stars, but in a single exposure of the LSST, it will map out a volume that's some 10 times bigger. And over the period of the survey, it will have mapped out a volume of the Milky Way some thousand times larger, simply because it will be able to see fainter stars at a greater distance, not just the stars that happen to be close to the sun. One spin-off, it's not the reason LSST is going to be built, but one spin-off is because it's going to be looking at billions of stars more than once, it's almost certainly going to pick up transits, which it will then tell other telescopes about to follow up if necessary. It'll be monitoring the brightness of billions of stars, and inevitably there's bound to be a few situations where exoplanets move in front of the stars and it sees the characteristic change of brightness. Given that it's going to be looking at all stars it can see, I haven't said so yet, but this telescope is going to be in the southern hemisphere, so it can see the small and large Magellanic clouds, so it is possible that it might end up detecting the existence of exoplanets in the Magellanic clouds, in which case this would be the first demonstration of finding a planet in another galaxy, which is a wonderful idea. Scientifically of limited benefit, perhaps, but a wonderful idea nonetheless. When it comes to looking at galaxies, we're perhaps all familiar with the idea that Hubble and other telescopes have got a limited field of view, but they can get a great deal of detail in distant galaxies. And here we see a clear example of a couple of galaxies that are interacting with each other and producing these characteristic so-called tidal tails of interaction, where stars are being affected by the gravity of their own galaxy, as well as the gravity of a neighboring the gravity of a neighboring galaxy, and as they interact, they tend to produce these streamers or tails of stars. Now, the Hubble has been told, go look at this one, that's interesting, go look at that one, that could be interesting as well. What the LSST will do is map out tens of billions of galaxies and find out how many of them are on their own and how many of them are interacting. This galaxy, for instance, M63, it might look a little bit ordinary in the sense of it looks like a spiral galaxy, but when we realize that the ability of the LSST not only to pick out faint galaxies, but to pick out the faint sky behind those galaxies or around those galaxies means that it'll be able to tell us more about, for instance, an object like this. If we take this color image and take the color out and invert it so we can see it a little more clearly, Perhaps you can now get the hint of some tidal tails. If you can't see them, let's increase the contrast. Now you can see this galaxy, which on its own just looked like a normal spiral galaxy. Now you can see these huge tidal effects of these arms, these streamers coming out, telling us that this galaxy has quite definitely interacted with another one in the past. The more such galaxies we see, the more we can determine how galaxy interactions and collisions are important in galaxy evolution. If that's the amount of information we can get out of one galaxy, how much are we going to learn from 10 or 20 billion galaxies? And similarly, this one, perhaps you can see the streamers in this case, but if we do the same trick and switch the contrast and make the contrast a bit uh, larger, you can see that this galaxy, which is almost edge on, has got huge tidal streamers coming from it, again telling us that this galaxy has definitely interacted with others in its lifetime. 
When it comes to thinking about dark matter and dark energy, we definitely need to answer some of these questions that have cropped up in the last 10 or 20 years or so. Only 5% of the universe is made up of stuff we understand. It's made up of protons and neutrons and electrons and stuff like you and me. That sort of stuff we understand, but that's only 5% of the total. That is really embarrassing for any physicist to admit that we only really understand, we only really partly understand 5% of what's out there. 75% or 70, 20, sorry, 25% or 27% is this mysterious dark matter. We know it's out there, we can see its effect, just like the wind. We can't see the wind, but we can see the effect on trees and leaves. So we know dark matter is out there, but we don't know what it is and we don't know exactly where it is. Two thirds of the universe appears to be dark energy. And again, we have evidence that it exists. The evidence is, is multi-stranded, and I'm not going to go through the details. But we think it's out there. It's responsible for accelerating the expansion of the universe. The universe's expansion was decelerating for a few billion years and slowing down, which is what we would expect if gravity was doing its stuff. But for the last few billion years, it appears that the expansion of the universe has been accelerating which was contrary to most people's understanding, and we only found out about this about 20 or so years ago. This so-called dark sector, as it's now come to be called, which sounds really cool, but it's really just an admission that we don't know what's going on. Dark matter and dark energy account for 95% of what's out there, so we really ought to understand that better. And one of the main things that LSST is going to provide for us is data about dark matter distribution and what dark energy has been doing in our universe for the last few billion years. So as I say, we know dark matter is out there. We think the dark matter forms a sort of web, a, a cosmic web, if you will, filaments and voids, and here, the, uh, the bright areas are galaxies, and it appears that galaxies form whenever these filaments of dark matter have come together. We think dark matter collapsed first in the early universe, and then ordinary matter piled in on top and started to form stars and galaxies. So galaxies apparently exist at the intersections of all these filaments of dark matter. This is a simulation. This is what a computer tells us we think the universe looks like but we don't know because we can't measure that at the moment. But one of LSST's jobs is to try and figure out whether this idea, this simulation of what the dark matter web of the universe looks like, whether that's what is actually out there or not. In other words, have we got the simulations right? Is dark matter uniformly distributed throughout a galaxy? Is it clumped? Do we have little clumps of dark matter floating around out there? Or is it uniformly positioned around where the visible matter of a particular galaxy is seen to be? Hopefully, the LSST will answer that question as well. Part of how it will do that job is by gravitational lensing. I mentioned a little while ago that if we have matter, it doesn't matter if it's visible matter or dark matter, it will bend the light that's coming from more distant objects. And this is a sort of simulation saying if we have some galaxies that are shown here in orange, which are a little bit closer than some of these more distant galaxies shown in blue, let me just run these little simulations again, they will distort the light from more distant galaxies. And the more dark matter we have, in the bottom right, the more that distortion. So if the LSST can map out the positions, the locations, the colors, the, the amount of distortion apparent in lots of different galaxies, we'll be able to get a handle on how much dark matter is out there. And as I said earlier, if we can get an idea of the dark matter distribution as a function of the age of the universe, it gives us a handle on what dark energy has been doing in our universe all this time. One of the clever ways it's going to get information, we can see here dark matter is indicated in red, but you have to remember by definition, dark matter is not visible. So in other words, that's not the actual view that the LSST will get. What the LSST will see is not the dark matter web, it'll see individual galaxies, which are these little 
indicate that these little ovals, these little ellipses shown in cyan. That is the view, if you ignore the stars, this is the view that the LSST will get. And by looking at where the galaxies are, how they're grouped, how they're oriented, their size, their shape, their orientation, it should be possible to say, well, if this is the way the galaxies are arranged in space, then we can infer that the dark matter web that must be producing that arrangement of galaxies must look like that. It doesn't work if you have a few dozen galaxies. It doesn't work if you have a few thousand galaxies. But if you have data from billions of galaxies, then you can infer what the dark matter is doing in order to imprint itself on the universe in the way that hopefully the LSST will see. So that's some of the science that we want to get out of the LSST. How will it be delivered? It will need a unique optical design. It will need the world's largest detector, the world's largest CCD detector. And it will need an outstanding observatory site. That was decided quite a few years ago. We know that the best sites in the world are either volcanic islands like Hawaii and the Canary Islands off the coast of Africa, or the Atacama Desert in Chile. And after a little bit of jiggery-pokery, it was decided that Chile is where this particular telescope is going to be located, or is located, given that they've already started construction. So, no, that's not it on the hill there. Um, the LSST is built in the same general location as Gemini South. So from the LSST site, if you look over to the neighboring mountain, you see Gemini South. So that's the Gemini South on the next peak along. So they took this particular location. They blew the top off a mountain. They then got a load of engineers to walk around saying, oh, don't like the look of that. Mm, yeah, OK, this will have to do then, yep. Uh, and then they started construction a few years ago. And I'm not sure exactly what state it's in now. This is already quite a few months old. Most of the laboratory um, support structure is there. The telescope is being built in, the, uh, in this turret, not quite a dome, in the turret on the right-hand side. That's, roughly speaking, what it's going to look like when it's finished. The main telescope in its turret there, support laboratories in the neighboring part of the building. And a small telescope off to the side, basically surveying sky conditions and making sure making sure the atmosphere is doing what you think it's doing. So again, this is just a sort of cross-section, so you can see the telescope in its turret, and then, if necessary, the mirror can come out and be re-illuminized, and various other support laboratories there. What about the optical design? How on earth do you manage to get a wide field but still keep everything absolutely pin-sharp? There's no point in having a wide field telescope if the stars and galaxies are going to be a little bit distorted or fuzzy in the corners. You've got to keep absolutely everything pin-sharp and, where possible, absolutely aberration-free. And it's been done for the LSST in a very novel three-mirror design. The primary mirror is 8.4 meters. You know that telescopes larger than that on Earth can exist, but they are made of segments. This is basically one of the largest single mirror uh, designs that can be made. The effective focal length is not so different. It's about 10 meters. And remember the F number, the focal length divided by the diameter. The focal length, the focal ratio is about F1. Remember. Hubble Space Telescope, F-22, the extremely large telescope, F-16. It would be really nice for astrophotographers to have an F-4 or an F-2.8 or an F-2 lens. This one is an F-1. It is really, really optically fast. How do they do that? Well, it's a novel design, as I've said. Let's just dim that out a bit so you can see more clearly. Light hits the main mirror, remember, eight meters or so in diameter, and then it's reflected to a secondary mirror, and then reflected back down to a tertiary mirror. Mirror three, you notice, is actually the same piece of glass as mirror one. In other words, they've taken a piece of glass and they've produced a figure suitable for mirror one up to a particular radius, and then inside that, they've made a different shape for mirror three, even though it's part of the same slab of glass. And then after bouncing off mirror three, it comes up to the camera. So this is them making the mirror, put a whole load of glass into a furnace, then spin the furnace whilst you heat it up, 
and then with a camera looking into the furnace, you watch it all melt. There it goes, like honey. And this just repeats three times, just so you can see what's going on. There's the glass melting. The honeycomb you can see in the background are the ribs that allow you to have a very large mirror without too much in the way of mass. And that's the mirror completed. Uh, not yet figured to the right shape. There's no indication of mirror three and mirror, two, uh, mirror one yet. That is just the blank as it came out of the furnace, 8.4 meters in diameter, but it gives you an idea of the scale of the telescope. Now, no, that's not the camera. This is just for scale to remind you that you've probably all got a camera in your pocket, and the smallest camera you can conceive of that's not actually a spy camera, is the sort of camera that you've got in your phone. The lens might be a millimetre or so in size, and the chip is probably also a millimetre or two in size. Just to give you an idea of scale, compared to the picture we've got there, that's the detector of the Hubble Space Telescope. And to show you it for real, if I can do this without blinding myself, that's the size of the Hubble Space Telescope Camera 3. It is about four by four centimetres, and as you can see here, it's about 16 megapixels. So for those that like the technicalities, the pixels are about 10 microns or so apart. And so it's 4,000 by 4,000 pixels, giving us 16 million pixels. And that gives us all of those wonderful views from the Hubble Space Telescope. The detector that's in the LSST is a little bit different. Let's start with the 16 megapixel Hubble chip just as a point of reference and remind ourselves that's how physically big it is. Now let's take that and let's add another eight of those detectors around the outside. Now we've got a very large detector. Remember the original 16 megapixels, you may say 16 megapixels, ha, huh, my camera's got more megapixels than that, which may indeed be true. Doesn't mean your camera is better than the Hubble, but yes, you may actually have more megapixels than that. Let's take Hubble, add eight, into a little package. Now let's imagine that that package is joined by eight others, and then another 12 others, and then a few extra chips just to give you focusing and tracking. That is the detector for the LSST. Remember, Hubble was that big. Another way of thinking of it, let me just give you the stats first. It's 0.6 meters by 0.6 meters and three gigapixels. And for the benefit of those in the room, and I'll see if I can work it out, sir, no need to hold your hands out because I have a mock-up of the actual detector here. So there it is. There's Hubble. There's the Hubble camera, effectively. There is the actual one-to-one, -one, and maybe it helps if I stand in front of it for this one. That's the actual size of the CCD detector in the LSST camera. The camera is about the size of a Volkswagen, or maybe a little bit bigger, and you can see the detector is absolutely huge. Not a paltry 16 megapixels, but three gigapixels, 3,000 megapixels. And the optics are designed to give a perfectly crisp view over the entire detector. I can't possibly show you what it's going to look like. Even a simulation of a three gigapixel image, how can I possibly show you a three gigapixel image? The best I can do is to say, imagine taking that little black dot there. Let's just take that little black dot and say, what would we expect to see if we took a single exposure, a single 15 second exposure, what would we see in that black rectangle? Well, that's roughly speaking what we would see. That's a simulation based on the optics, based on the camera sensitivity, based on the seeing conditions in Chile. That's what it's expected to see in the little black dot in a single 15 second exposure. And remember the actual chip itself is 3,000 times larger than the area you're looking at at the moment. And that's what can be seen in a single 15 second exposure. And that's a result of partly the sensitivity of the camera, but mainly the very fast optics. Remember, we want to cover a very large field of view, which you can do with a huge detector like this. 
and by keeping the exposures down to 15 seconds, you can still get to 25th magnitude with a 15 second exposure, and that means you're capable of surveying the entire sky quickly. Just again, a reminder of fields of view. If we think of the field of view of the moon, roughly half a degree across, a digitized sky survey image might be one degree, which gives you an idea it's much bigger than the full moon. But the Hubble Space Telescope field of view is only that red rectangle. On the same scale, if we wanted to represent the LSST field of view, we can't fit it in. The best I can do is to give you an indication of, roughly speaking, what the field of view is in terms of the circle that would surround the chip I've just shown you. Something like three degrees or so across. It's going to work with a number of different filters. Uh, what is it? Six filters ranging from just about the UV through the visible and actually quite a few IR. Infrared is quite important. Those of you who have been following the story of the Webb Space Telescope will, now, will know how important infrared can be. And so there are, in principle, six filters that can be moved into position. At any given time, there won't be six filters in the filter holder. You know the size of the chip and the filter will have to cover the entire chip, of course. And so you can imagine how big the filter wheel would have to be. In fact, they've got a very novel design whereby the filters are held in the 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock positions and then rotated into the position whenever you want that particular filter to be used. You don't change filters too often because it wastes a little bit of time. It might take quite a few seconds to change filters. So you generally take a patch of sky in one filter and then go back and take a different patch of sky, perhaps, with a different filter, rather than continually change the filters back and forth. But again, this picture is nice because it gives you an idea of scale. There's a standard human with the head chopped off on the right-hand side, uh, and the, uh, the detector itself that I was telling you about is sitting somewhere in the middle there. It's going to be surveying whatever part of the sky it can see. From Chile, you can see, of course, quite a lot of the southern hemisphere and a bit of the northern hemisphere. You're not going to be able to see as far north as we can see from the UK, for instance. It will be surveying principally the southern part of the sky. But in addition, it will try and make sure it covers the galactic uh, plane as well as the ecliptic to try and make sure it catches all of the solar system objects. Of course, there will be some objects that are moving out of the ecliptic and they will be missed from time to time. But you can see here the color coding is how many times it will visit that chunk of sky. It's going to try and cover the whole sky every three nights and keep going and keep going and keep going over 10 years, which means some bits of the sky will be visited a thousand times. So by the time the project has finished, if you want to pick a star, we'll have a thousand data points for the position and color and brightness of that particular star over the 10-year period. Less in the South Pole, you notice that's green, so the South Pole is not going to be visited quite as often as the rest of the sky, simply because the South Pole isn't very high as seen from Chile, and you're looking through a lot of atmosphere, so there's a limited benefit in taking a, a long set of data from that particular part of sky. There will also be so-called deep, uh, deep, deep drilling fields, meaning if there is a particular area of interest, a particular cluster, a particular galaxy cluster, they might come back and visit that more often than a thousand times during the whole of the survey. If each image is three billion pixels, and it takes an image every 15 seconds, and hopefully it continues for 10 years. That's a lot of data. Shed loads, in fact, I think is the technical term. Just a little reminder about disk storage options, digital storage options. Do people remember these things? <laughs> OK, I'm not saying that they are going to be using floppy disks. It's just a point of reference. A floppy disk holds 1 million bytes of information. And that's barely enough these days to hold one digital image. I bet you didn't think zebras were going to turn up in this talk, did you? <laughs> OK, so there's a picture I took a, a couple of years ago of zebras. And this is something like, in this reproduction, something like a two megapixel image. And the image occupied something like half a megabyte 
of disk storage. So in other words, if I wanted to, I could attempt to put two of those images onto a floppy disk. But of course, we don't use floppy disks anymore. So one option is to say, ah, yeah, but DVDs are better. If I had a DVD, then a DVD can store gigabytes of information, not megabytes. And of course, um, a gigabyte is 1,000 megabytes. And that's enough for thousands of digital photos. I reckon for some of the images I've taken of wildlife, I might be able to store 10,000 images on a DVD. But if the LSST attempted to use DVDs as the storage, how long would it take for them to fill up not one DVD? Let's, take, let's give it a bit more of a challenge. How long would it take the LSST to fill that many DVDs, where each DVD is capable of storing 10,000 images of Zebra, but the LSST could fill that many DVDs in approximately 30 minutes. So we say, OK, we need to go somewhere different. Let's go up a notch. Let's go to a terabyte disk. OK, so a terabyte is 1,000 gigabytes. So now we're talking. Now it's just about sensible to talk about let's store the data on terabyte disks. So a terabyte is 1,000 gigabytes. A gigabyte is 1,000 megabytes. So a terabyte disk. Well, unfortunately, that's going to fill up quite, quite quickly as well, because a terabyte disk is only equivalent to about 200 DVDs or so. So what that means is that we're going to need about 20 terabyte disks every night. One observing night of about 10 hours of darkness is going to fill something of order 20 terabytes of disk space. It should be operational at least 300 nights of the year, possibly 310, 320, maybe a few more. It'll be down for maintenance, and occasionally they don't get good weather. But generally speaking, you can take 20 terabytes on a good night, multiply it by 300 good nights in a year, and assume it's going to run for 10 years. Add in a little bit of technical data, because you need calibration frames and other tech stuff as well. It's estimated that it's going to need 500 thousand terabyte disks in order to f store all of the information that's coming out of the LSST project. That is an awful lot of disks. I'm not even sure they've made them yet, but even if they get them on demand, it's still going to be a huge amount of data that is required to be processed. A picture is taken. Remember, one exposure means expose this for 15 seconds on a particular chunk of sky. What they actually do is take two pictures. They take a 15-second exposure, then another 15-second exposure. Why? Well, as a sort of a check. You can never tell if a cosmic ray or something else is going to come zooming through your detector. So every so often, you're going to get a, a dot or a streak through your image, which is nothing to do with what you're trying to image, but is an artifact of background radiation. So they take two images to check that everything looks sensible and to watch out for cosmic rays. So every 30 seconds, they will take two images. They will then send those via the intranet a dedicated fiber optic landline from the top of the mountain to the bottom of the mountain where HQ is, the base site called La Serena in Chile. It is estimated that they should be able to shift 15 gigabytes comfortably in about a second or so using a 100 gigabit per second intranet. They will then switch to the internet and send that via internet links to America, from South America to North America. They're going to send it to the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, which is in Urbana-Champaign in the USA. That is the supercomputer that's going to do the number crunching. For any of you who are rather miffed with your broadband speed, the idea of shifting things at the rate of 100 gigabits per second or a couple of fiber optics running at 40 gigabytes per second, you may ask, how on earth do you get that sort of internet speed? Wrong question. You're answering, you're asking the question backwards. Optic fiber is easily capable of shifting data at that rate. What's the reason that you don't get it as a consumer, apart from the fact that BT would charge you quite a lot for it? It's the fact that all of the packets on the internet are getting in the way of you shifting your data from A to B or from B to A. 
most of that packet stuff on the internet that's not yours is probably videos of cats. <laughs> Take YouTube out of the equation, then suddenly your internet speed goes up by orders of magnitude. So if you've got fiber optic links down the mountain, fine, they're yours. If you're relying on the internet to get you from South America to North America, all you have to do is to ban all cat videos and suddenly you've got 40 gigabits per second to play with. And it should be possible to take that data and shift it to North America in four seconds. North America picks it up at the supercomputer application center and basically says, right, I've now got some images. I want to check whether those images look the same as the ones from last night or last week or last month or whenever we last imaged this patch of sky. What has changed? Have any objects moved? Have any objects changed their brightness? Have any objects changed their color? Basically, it will try and do that for the 3 billion pixels that it's looking at, or 6 billion because there's two images. It'll take those 6 billion pixels and try and work out what is different from last time. And it will create a list of everything that has changed. That takes a certain amount of number crunching because they intend to do that within 60 seconds. Having got the information off the mountain from South America to North America, the job of the supercomputers in North America are to tell astronomers around the world if anything has changed, and that data will be hopefully no more than 60 seconds out of date in terms of changes. The number of changes could be as much as 10 million. An event is something is different. An event could be this object has moved. An event could be this object has changed its brightness. An event could be this object wasn't there before but is there now. The event could be this is now a little bit redder than it was yesterday. If you wish, you can get a text message for every event. So some astronomers might sign up for, yes, I'd love to get 10 million texts every night telling me what's in the sky. More likely, an astronomer will sign up for, just tell me about the supernovas. Just tell me about the asteroids. Just tell me about variable stars. So it's unlikely that one individual will sign up for all of those, but in principle, it's possible. As well as working out what's changed, it will build up over a period of time a catalog of everything that's out there. It will record and calculate the position to milli arc second accuracy, the position of every star and galaxy, the brightness of every star and galaxy, the color of every star and galaxy. And it'll end up with a catalog of some 20 billion galaxies and hopefully about 17 billion stars. If you wish, there will be an app. So you don't have to get all of the text. You can simply have an app that says, for instance, what's the LSST doing right now? What's it imaging? What did it find last night? How many supernova did it find? What is interesting? Show me an image of what it's doing at the moment and what's going on. Even if you were to only pick one thing, like, I don't know, supernova, for instance, the number of supernova that can be found by the LST is going to be absolutely mind-boggling. If you think about the expansion of the universe accelerating, that was determined by data from 20 to 0 supernova. The total number of supernova that have ever been seen in world history by all telescopes in the world is about a thousand. It is expected that LSST will probably catch more than a thousand supernova every night for the entire 10 years that it's operational. So the number of supernova that we will have data for is going to go up and will double on the first night and will keep on increasing for the number of years that LSST runs. So the amount, the sheer amount of data that's going to be flooding out of this telescope is going to be absolutely vast. So it's on the horizon. It's been on the horizon for quite a long time. They've been working on it, of course. They're building it. The camera the, the mirror was finished some time ago. The camera is in its final stages. They, uh, the, the construction of the mountaintop observatory is a little bit delayed, they say, because of COVID. Who knows? 
It's been on the horizon for quite a while, but it's now getting very, very close. It might still be more than a few months away, but it is not much more than a few months away. I know we've been saying that about the Webb Space Telescope for a long time, but this is definitely on its way. Let me finish with an addendum. I've been calling this the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, the LSST. This acronym has been around for a long, long time, and people have been using it for, I don't know, best part of a decade or so. But in 2019, it was decided that the LSST Observatory was going to be renamed the Vera C. Rubin Observatory in recognition of the work carried out by Vera Rubin measuring the effect of dark matter on galaxies back in the 1960s. And the telescope itself, which I've been calling the LSST, has now been renamed, and it's now been renamed the Shimonyi Survey Telescope. Still a little bit of a mouthful, but at least LSST told you what it does. This has now been renamed to acknowledge the fact that private donors have put some cash on the table, and so the telescope has been renamed for them. But because LSST is such an established acronym and has been for a decade, people were reluctant to let LSST go. Not least because they've already got a domain name called lsst.org. They didn't want to have to throw that away and rename it. So they decided to say that the survey of the sky is now going to be called the Legacy Survey of Space and Time. Look at that. Look at that acronym. What a coincidence, eh? So it is still correct to talk about the LSST if you're talking about what it's going to do, how it's going to do it, and the data it produces. So the observatory is now called Vera Rubin. The telescope is now called Shimonyi. But the idea of the project can still be referred to as LSST, and hence LSST.org is still a valid domain name where you can find all the information you want about what the LSST is going to do for us in the future. So I've been telling you about sky surveys, what historically we had in the past, why we need new ones, why we need a different telescope to do the surveying, what science will the LSST deliver for us, and what technology do we need in terms of optics, in terms of detectors, in actually to deliver that science. And I've said something about the survey strategy and a reminder of the huge amounts of data that are going to be coming out of the project, which will keep PhD students alive for many decades to come. Thank you all for listening.